Great. So as we all know, data center computing these days is pervasive. And the most obvious examples are data centers run by internet service providers. But there are, of course, many other examples. Data centers tasked to do things such as big data processing, grid computing, cloud computing, whatever the latest buzzword is, you name it. One thing that these data center or warehouse scale computers share in common is that communication is essential. It's really the lifeblood that enables many distinct computers to act as a cohesive whole. Now, as engineers and scientists, we have many choices of protocols that we can use to enable these computers to act and work together. Probably the most obvious protocol to choose is TCP, if for no other reason than it has a massive installed base of existing applications. Moreover, by choosing TCP, we avoid resolving problems that TCP has long since solved, that we would have to resolve if we chose, for instance, a UDP-based protocol. There's one major catch. TCP really was not designed for this use case. It was not designed to run purely in intra-data center. And in particular, the relationship between propagation delay and queuing delay inside of a data center are inverted with what we often find in the internet. So I'm going to talk about in this talk our experience in using TCP in our data center, problems we've encountered, as well as sol our solutions to some of those problems. I'll start with a little background, followed by digging into a few of these problems. The paper will contain more, as well as our I was, it was our deployment of DCTCP, which I think people in this audience will find particularly interesting. So to give a little context to this work, in our data center, we, we run many different types of applications. For instance, we run some very large-scale computations, such as Monte Carlo simulation or large-scale data analysis. Those applications tend to be structured as shown in the graph. Some set of base data is taken and transformed, and intermediate data is generated. And that process repeats until at the end, a summary or reduction function is applied. In addition, we have more latency sensitive applications, applications that face end users and maybe important end users who you don't want to get upset. You don't want to have their, their GUI go pause. You don't want to show them an hourglass. And in addition, we have multiple groups sharing the data center that may not be aware of each other. So we want to keep these groups from hurting each other. Now, the initial motivation for this work was this, in these large-scale computations, we found that even if tasks were uniform, if we plotted task completion time, we found that there was a tail. And when we dug into it, and I should say this is problematic because this repeats several times during the course of an application. And so our application end-to-end -end runtime can be greatly degraded from this, this effect. Now, of course, there are well-known workarounds for this type of problem, rerunning slow tasks, um, or we can overlap computations such that even if our application is inefficient, our hardware is efficiently utilized. Neither one of these, of these solutions is particularly attractive. We really wanted to dig to what was the source of this problem. And so digging deeper, we found that in our case, the root cause tended to be I.O. There's, of course, been discussion about, oh, bad hardware or, say, ECC memory errors can degrade performance. We tend to sweep bad hardware out of our, net, out of our data center so that the real root cause of this tended to be more I.O. And when we dug into why the I.O. was performing poorly, the culprit was the network. Now, in addition, another motivation for this work was that we had known cases where applications had interfered with each other, and we wanted to reduce those. So I'm going to talk about, in the rest of this talk, how the specific problems we saw in the network and how we addressed those. So first, I'd like to talk about latency and application coupling. If as, as few as two TCP flows contend over a queue by design and comp common implementation, TCP will fill the queue entirely until it drops packets. A side effect is that, that any packet traversing that same queue will incur an, an increase in latency. And inside of the data center, that latency swing is two to three orders of magnitude, which is dramatic. Now, even if an application is not owned by, say, this, or I should say a packet that traverses that queue is not owned by the same group, it will incur that same swing in latency. So that applications, distinct applications, become coupled together merely by their sharing of a bottleneck link. Moreover, even if they don't share a bottleneck link, the fact that they share a switch can, can impact one application because of, say, congestion on another link on that same switch that's stealing RAM away from that shared memory switch. So as a result, in a large organization at Morgan Stanley, you can have fun effects such as an aggressive memory, or I should say an aggressive data-consuming application 
can affect, say, a very small, important application owned by other users who didn't even know that other application exists. So when this happens, a small, important application goes about trying to discover who's hurting them. Network operations winds up in the middle, and lots of fun social inter interactions ensue. <laughs> so this is entertaining, but we don't want this. We want to stop this from happening. Now, the next class of problems we found with TCP were related to in-cast. Like many data centers, we have distributed storage systems, and those tend to, tend to generate in-cast, which occurs whenever a large number of senders send to a single receiver in a short time frame. Now, in addition to, to regular loss by TCP, what happens in in-cast is we tend to lose whole windows of traffic. When that happens, TCP times out. And to visualize what that looks like, this is a TCP sequence graph taken from actual production a few years back. And what we would like to see is as TCP sequence numbers ascend on the y-axis, over time we'd like to just to have a nice straight line. And instead what we see are raggedness, and more importantly, massive gaps caused by timeouts in TCP. So this is what incast tend tends to cause, and this is very evil for certain applications, for most applications. Now, a way to reduce this, of course, is we can lower that timeout value. And that is, in fact, I believe, necessary, but it's not necessarily sufficient because a couple of reasons. First of all, we'd like to have zero gaps, not just small timeouts. Secondly, this does not address the latency issue that we find with TCP at all. So I'd like to talk about now how we address latency, and that was by implementing DCTCP, which gets to the core, the root cause of this latency. And the key idea of DCTCP is we want the queue occupancy to be low. That then has a bunch of benefits. By keeping queue occupancy low, we can reduce loss, timeouts, and then network delay caused from inside the network. And what was attractive to us about DCTCP is the ingredients that we needed to use that were all present today. We could turn it on right now. Now, a couple of questions we had were, if we did that, would anything break? And in short, the answer to that question was yes. So I'm going to talk about what broke and how we fixed it. The first problem that we found was with coexistence with TCP. Now, for the purposes of this paper, we demonstrate this with a very simple experiment. We simply send two flows. We start a TCP flow, and then after a few seconds, we start a contending DCP, DC TCP flow over, over the same link. What we'd like to see is that they share the bandwidth when they're both running concurrently. Instead, what we see is the following. We start, as you see at the start, TCP shown in blue is consuming the entire link bandwidth, but as soon as we start the DC TCP contending flow, it consumes the entire link. This is very evil because it's the exact opposite of what we wanted to see. The cause of this has to do with how switches implement ECN marking. Now, under DC TCP, there's a single marking threshold on switches. And when packets arrive in this queue, and the queue is below the marking threshold, life is good. Everybody lives happily. The trouble ensues above the threshold. Now, for DC TCP packets, this isn't a problem. They're marked with CE or congestion experienced. But for regular TCP packets, when they enter this queue, what the switch does is it throws them away. Why? Because in ECN, marking and throwing packets away are supposed to be about the same. So that's a reasonable choice. But in the presence of DCTCP, DCTCP only responds to the fraction of packets marked. So TCP is going to back off much more aggressively than DCTCP will, and DCTCP will wind up squashing TCP. So the only way we had to resolve this problem was by resorting to implementing or leveraging quality of service tools present inside of our network. The next problem we found was with connection establishment. Even if, pa even if traffic, we found that even when our traffic was all DCTCP, we would have difficulty establishing network connections. So again, for the purposes of this paper, we isolated this to a nice, simple to run test. And what we did is we had a number of existing T uh, DCTCP flows, and after those flows existed, we tried a number of times to establish a new connection. And so on this chart, what is plotted is, given the number of existing flows, what, was, what fraction of connection attempts were able to succeed? And as you can see in this chart, as the number of existing connections is, it grows very high at all, our ability to establish a new connection drops to zero quite quickly. So why is this? This has to do with whether or not the control packets, SYN and SYNX, support ECN marking. Now, historically, they did not for security concerns. 
However, the original DCTC paper is silent on this issue. The implementation that was generated as part of that effort, however, does not mark control packets. And the result is the behavior shown here. So we have two viable approaches we can use to solve this problem. The first is to mark these packets. The second is to segregate those control packets like we did with regular TCP traffic. We consider that latter approach to be undesirable because that would split our flows across two different paths and they would share fate with two different environments. And so for that reason, we mark those packets and we believe that in the data center, the security concerns are moot, or at least we have much bigger problems if they're not moot. In addition, there are some non-technical challenges. Network administrators are by nature adverse to change. They don't get a lot of praise if the network works. When the network fails, they hear about it. So we found the keys to selling this to our network administrators was to demonstrate that we would make their lives easier, to demonstrate that we could decouple applications and reduce that, that known effect that they had seen before of applications hurting each other. In particular, data-heavy applications would, be, would, would not hurt latency-sensitive applications as much. Also, we were able to support existing TCP traffic. Lastly was timing. We timed our change to roll out when there was an ongoing switch change. This is important so that you don't get flagged as a false positive as causing some sort of outage. And I, before, so I'd like to now briefly discuss some of the performance benefits we achieved using some benchmarks you can repeat at home. First of all, I'd like to show an in-cast example where we measured in-cast from 19 senders sending long-lived flows to a single receiver, and we measured throughput and latency. And we used this to compare TCP with DCTCP. The next graph here shows the mean throughput over those 19 flows, and the error bars show the minimum throughput flow and the maximum throughput flow. Now note the mean is the same. That is because even when the TCP flows time out, somebody else steps in and consumes the bandwidth. So the mean's going to be the same. But that doesn't tell the true story because what's happening under the hood is that some of those TCP, TCP flows have large gaps and that's bad. So this is a nice, whereas in DC, TCP land, we see that there are in fact, there's in fact a nice tight range between minimum and maximum flow throughput. And that's because there are no timeouts and in fact no retransmissions occurring in this particular test. Moreover, latency of DCTCP is two orders of magnitude better than regular TCP. So in this test we're doing a very good job of reducing latency by leveraging DCTCP. Now in addition, we repeated the test run in the original DCTCP paper that analyzed stability, convergence, and fairness. And we ran this at 10 gigabits per second. And what this test did is it slowly introduced an increasing number of contending flows, starting at one, going to five. What we would ideally see in this test is as additional flows come on, we would like to see a nice stepwise function where the per flow throughput decreases in a nice, um, clean manner. But instead what we see in the DCP is shown in this chart. We see a lot of variance, lack of stability, not great convergence, fairness varying like crazy. Under DCTCP, in contrast, it's much better. We see a very reasonably clean stepwise decrease in throughput as we introduce flows. There's just one hitch with this. This wasn't supposed to happen. The original analysis said that TCP actually should outperform DCTCP with respect to stability, convergence, and fairness. So this hinted to us that there was a different problem with TCP that we had not yet uncovered. And so we looked at the two flow case. So looking at the two flow case, what we see is that TCP is just extremely slow to converge. We're talking seconds. That shouldn't happen. We should be talking in terms of round trips, not seconds. What's going on? We found the answer to this to be in TCP's receive buffer setting. Now historically, network programmers had the task of setting the receive buffer, where they should set it to something like the bandwidth delay product of the network. That is bad in the sense that that couples that application to a particular environment. When the application moves to another environment, it breaks, or the developers have to go in and manually, manually change it. So to fix this, TCP has automatic receive buffer sizing. The trouble inside of a data center is that the, delay, the bandwidth delay product of the network is a function of the latency, which can swing two to three orders of magnitude, and is moreover a partial function of the receive buffer size. So the problem of finding the right receive buffer size feeds back on itself. And the algorithms presently used for this 
do not converge very well and do very, very poorly. And that is the source of this trouble. So what happens if we remove this and we simply manually fix the receive buffer size? All of a sudden we see that TCP performs much better, nearly perfect as we would expect. So the take home from this is first of all, there's additional work to be done on receive buffer sizing. And secondly, sorry, secondly that T DC TCP removes this problem to some extent, or at least mitigates it, so that we don't, we don't need to worry about this as much. Now, in addition, we looked at scale, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to delve into this too much, but we wanted to know how high could DCTCP scale? It can only scale so high after all. What we found was the scaling limit on DCTCP was it the fact that it was always, the implementation was always willing to offer up, two, had a floor on the number of segments it was willing to offer up to the network, and that floor was two. And as a result, each sender in DCTCP offers a minimum amount of load, and at a certain point, that extends link, that exceeds link bandwidth. And that winds up being the limitation to our scale. And we looked at a couple of ways to mitigate this, and we're evaluating further now. So in conclusion, our work, we found that TCP has significant performance problems in data centers, as others have verified. And I've discussed some of those in this talk, and we also found one that I have not seen discussed elsewhere, which is the failure of received buffer tuning inside of data centers. Moreover, we've talked about how we leverage DCTCP to overcome many of these problems and how DCTCP as originally implemented was not viable on our network due to the problems that I discussed. But we were able to overcome those problems and we've contributed that back to the implementation and we're actually pushing that back out to the public so that, so that it can be available in your favorite operating system. And with that, I'll open to questions. Thanks. Thanks for your nice talk. I'm Wei Bai from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So in your paper, you evaluate convergence time of DC TCP and TCP. So my question is, have you enabled ECN for TCP? Have we compared ECN or enabled ECN? Uh, my question is, have you enabled e for ECN for TCP? So DC TCP uses the ECN mechanisms for, for an entirely different pur purpose. Yeah. So we have our switches are supporting ECN in a sense, yeah. but they're using that ECN mechanism to support DCTCP. But I mean, you can enable ECN for TCP, right? You don't need to use the DCTCP algorithm. So inside of the network, we can't really have these two mechanisms living together. This particular paper, we do not analyze ECN. The initial authors of DCTCP did analyze ECN and compare it with DCTCP and found it to be fragile and difficult to adjust to achieve yeah. similar performance. So we ourselves did not analyze using ECN. We are using the same underlying mechanisms that ECN uses. And once you've, once you've used that for DCTCP, you can't really use that on the same exact cues anyway for, for, um, for, DC, for ECN straight, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks. So er, uh, earlier today we heard uh, people were ruling out DCTCP because you have to maintain kernel patches, but it sounds like you wholeheartedly embraced it. Do you have any idea how industry in general is either shying away from carrying patches or embracing it as you have? So I missed a couple of the, imp I dropped a couple of the important packets in your, sorry, they, they rejected it for, what were the reasons uh, again? They, they said you have to carry kernel patches and so that it's kernel not patches. feasible because it, it's not. Uh, so kernel patches we can address. We've actually worked with Red Hat and we're contributing this back in the kernel. So this will be, this should be mainstream. I think Windows has this right now. I think it's in Windows Server Live if I'm correct. Microsoft people can correct me. Uh, in Linux, it's coming soon. FreeBSD is working on it as well. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks for the talk. Uh, just a question about kind of the use cases. Um, so there's been a lot of work post DCTCP on mechanisms that do a lot better. Now, not all of them are deployable, but in terms of the use cases, I mean deployable today, in terms of the use cases that you see, um, does DCTCP solve your problems, or if there were solutions that can give you even better tail latency, uh, you'd actually be interested in those? 
Right, so there was, a, there was at least one work that, there were some, of course, as you kind of alluded to, that are not viable, they require hardware changes, and there was, but there were some that did not. We, one issue is we have long lived TCP, there, there are some that have to do with priorities and setting different priorities for different flows. We did not do that because our flows tend to be long lived, and we didn't see an easy way to mid flow change our priority. Mm -hmm. And DC TCP also was, we viewed it as the lowest risk in a sense, it had the least amount of code changes. So given that, that's why we went for, for DC TCP instead of reaching further. That's not to say more couldn't be done or shouldn't be done, but that's why we reached for that first. Thank you. Um, hi, just a quick question about the receiver, uh, receiver buffer tuning. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I, I actually don't think that uh, we need a full bandwidth delay product the receiver buffer in many cases. Uh, maybe in uh, data center network, yes, because now in data center network, your receiver buffer is basically your uh, network buffer. But in wide area network, uh, because there is uh, this link speed mismatch, at the end of the day when the receiver receives the packet, it only needs a small receiver buffer because it's on uh, memory memory bus is draining the queue very fast, so it, do, it really doesn't need uh, a full bandwidth delayed product uh, receiver buffer. So I'm just uh, curious what kind of a uh, uh, receiver buffer you're using in this, uh, in this, in this tuning scenario. Okay, well that sounds like a great paper, but for our cases, what we have done is we have, we, we are manually setting receiver buffers in most of our applications, but as I mentioned, DCTCP mitigates the need for us to do that manually to some extent, so not all of our applications do manually set it. Our most, um, our most aggressive ones do for historical reasons. They were running under TCP before we switched to DCTCP, so they do manually set the receive buffer size. Uh, no, I mean, I mean uh, TCP itself doesn't really need the, like full bandwidth daily product in many cases uh, to like sustain high, especially at the receiver side. Maybe in the, in the network, yes, but uh, at the receiver side, because the receiver memory bus is draining uh, the data very fast, it, uh, if it, the data, for example, is coming in with 100 megabits per second, it doesn't really need a, a, a very large buffer there. Yeah, we, we really have, we provision for the worst case, if you will. Okay, I see. Thanks. Yep. I actually had a question about in-cast. So you actually showed that uh, in your application, and you made a statement early in the talk that for distributed storage, in-cast tends to happen quite a bit, and you showed, an, you had an example where you had 19 servers like pumping in hundreds of megabytes into a single receiver. I'm actually curious what kind of applications see this and is the receiver is the application or the storage server? So if you can share some thoughts on wh why NCAS is happening or where is it happening? Sure, it happens all over the place really. We have, we have two, two different types of storage systems we, we use. We have a distributed file system and a distributed key value store. And they have different um, you know, usage patterns Larger types of traffic tend to come from our distributed file system. That tends to have larger file blocks that will feed in. So that will have lower degrees of incast, but much, much larger flows. Our key value store tends to have much, much smaller flows, but massive degrees of incast because it scatters much more randomly. And that one will actually have incast on both ends, both on the, the, the puts, if you will, the storage, and on the receiving end. So we will do, at some phases of that computation, tend to do an all-to-all -all shuffle where they're receiving where everybody's basically storing to everybody. That's the worst for us. And all the all in cast is actually much worse than just a single in cast because then, then the, the shared memory switch can't help any one particular person because everybody's busy. Okay, great. All right, let's tag Lang and uh, all the speakers of the session.